uh, distinguished IALS speaker to... program, uh, giving an opportunity to our students and our faculty to interact with some of the best legal minds across the globe who have distinguished themselves in their respective fields. To start with this academic series, we have with us today Justice Richard Goldstone, former Justice of the South African Constitutional Court, to discuss on a very important topic, the current state of international criminal law and the necessity for an international anti-corruption court. It is due to the untiring and unwavering efforts of our director that it is possible to host such a series. Dr. Gurpur has been instrumental and has made tremendous contributions in the internationalization efforts at Symbiosis International Dean University, especially under the law schools that are under its banner. The international, uh, internationalization efforts include impressive number of international collaborations with universities across the world, students and faculty exchange, mm -hmm. international projects like Eurasia, 21st Century Teach Skills Project, DAD and Erasmus Grants, and membership with international bodies such as the IALS under whose aegis we are doing this uh, series, the International Association of Law Schools, the Asian Law Institute, the IUCN and the GAJE. In recognition of her contributions to the Indian legal academia, she was listed in the book 100 Legal Luminaries of India by LexisNexis. Dr. Gurpur has also been conferred with the prestigious annual Kirtur Rani Chinnamma Award by the government of Karnataka in 2018 for her work towards the empowerment of women. I would like to now invite Dr. Gurpur to deliver the welcome address. Uh, thank you, Professor Lassia, and welcome uh, Justice Richard Gladstone. Uh, we have had the privilege of hosting an international judge for the first time delivering the webinar, Sir, you kickstart a new best practice in the challenges amidst many blocks posed by this global pandemic. Welcome to you, sir. And we also thank you, your gracious approach to us in terms of agreeing to deliver this lecture. First of all, uh, uh, you must be already familiar with Symbiosis International University and Symbiosis Law School Pune. Um, IALS has uh, been our great supporter. We have been the members of IALS uh, since 2007. Ever since uh, Dr. Frank took over the leadership, we have had a lot of innovation, which includes uh, having a judges collective as part of the IALS uh, think tank. So uh, we have had many judges who had enriched our own uh, global audience meet which we hosted for the IALS in 2017. In that meet, uh, we had the privilege of creating a dialogue between judges in terms of enhancing the legal education uh, quality. Uh, one of the ways was to see that judges engage in academic process of the institutes and also engage as mentors for the prospective lawyers as well as prospective judges. So, sir, your presence is going to be very, very valuable from both these perspectives. In addition to symbiosis passion and DNA of internationalization of higher education for promoting international understanding through quality education. Sir, uh, our law school was created in 1977 as the first standard higher education institution under the symbiosis banner. Symbiosis was founded by a botany professor with a philanthropic uh, and uh, generous outlook to support the African students in Pune in the 70s when they were alienated due to the post-colonial climate that we had. So our law school was the second one in the landscape of Pune in 1977. And today we have more than 19 law schools in Pune itself. And India has about 1,215 law schools in various hues and shades affiliated to the universities, law universities. And we also have law schools like us, which are constituents of, a, uh, of an autonomous university. So uh, if you look at the website of Symbiosis Law School Pune, you would agree with me that this law school has been on the forefront of 
legal education uh, uh, reform movement. In our country, we have had great legal educationists like Professor Bakshi, Professor Menon, who have uh, uh, kickstarted the idea of bringing legal education at par with other professional education like medical education. So some of the reforms which were introduced were a fully fledged five year law program, which was started in mid 80s. And Symbiosis Law School Pune was the pioneer among three or four other law schools across India to start this program. Till then, we had graduates entering the law program as a short part time program. So fire law course itself was introduced to bring that professionalism and fully oriented serious law program and not law as a side degree to get promotion or an additional degree on the CV. So fire law program in Symbiosis Law School is also a kind of innovation because we were the first law school among two others to introduce a very unique BBA LLB program where the students get an integrated law degree with management and business expertise alongside the law. Till then in India, humanities or social sciences and law combination was the only one prevailing. Today we have these programs elevated to BBA LLB honors program and BLLB honors program, sir. Aside from that, we have got our postgraduate program, one year program in which we bring in both these programs. We bring a lot of international content, international teachers, international best practices and our own teachers take these best practices abroad through our various projects and uh, exchange programs. Our students have the option of spending a semester abroad, bringing their grades here. So we have uh, altogether about 2000 students out of which uh, a large majority about 1700 belong to this undergraduate program. Another 100 belong to uh, postgraduate program with the eight specializations. This year we are introducing uh, European Union legal studies as a specialization. And then uh, we have the PhD program where we already have had about 20 PhD graduates and we are having a, a, a strength of about 50 plus PhD students pursuing PhD with us. I must also share with you, sir, we have had very strong relationship with South African universities. Two law schools have been on board and uh, we have had uh, a law professor Radley uh, coming here for uh, uh, I mean on a visit uh, once and then uh, he has been in touch developing research papers developing curriculum. We are looking at African legal studies as well. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you that when South African constitution was being formulated, uh, India was recommended as the country to be engaging in uh, drafting this constitution. And I have had the privilege of studying in a law school, uh, sorry, it, working in a law school, uh, which was closely engaged with this, the National Law School of Bangalore. So uh, we recently recalled the, the way in which uh, the South African constitution has been an innovative constitution, taking seriously a lot of areas which we should have uh, taken more seriously in the post-colonial, post-independence era. Uh, for example, right to water uh, or uh, right to family. So some of these dimensions were discussed recently. So we are looking at, sir, uh, going ahead, a uh, kind of uh, mooting competition on comparative constitution where we would like to bring on board judges like you to formulate the problem to judge the cases. So, sir, I'm sure that uh, uh, your uh, learned exposition today, particularly in the area of anti-corruption, is going to be very, very pertinent to our country. Uh, you would agree that uh, post-colonial countries have had very high rank in terms of uh, perception index about corruption, and India is no exception. And in India, anti-corruption laws have been uh, created, but they have been weakened also by procedures, etc. Uh, and uh, I, I really admire the fact that you picked on a topic of transnational dimension. Uh, now that is a dimension which is bogging us down these days. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that your learned exposition alongside the live cases that you would have dealt with and the reforms you would have engaged with as a jurist would definitely give richer insights to our students. Once again, I welcome you on behalf of our management, on behalf of our faculty, our vice chancellor, pro chancellor and chancellor, on behalf of our students. 
um, and I also register here that uh, uh, the IALS is to be uh, indebted to here for bringing this very, very rich quality input to our quality legal education drive. Uh, welcome once again, sir, and uh, I look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I proceed? Thank you very much indeed to Dr. Gopur yes, for your. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, we would have welcomed you in Pune with flowers, with mementos, which we miss. So, virtually, we connect uh, with those kinds of feelings and uh, hearty welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, so th thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Lassia, start, start. So thank you very much, ma'am, for the welcome address. Um, our speaker today is uh, Justice Richard Goldstone, the former justice of uh, South African Constitutional Court uh, in South Africa. Uh, he was um, uh, the judge in South Africa for 23 years and the last nine years as a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Since retiring from the bench, he has taught as a visiting professor in a number of uh, United States and European law schools. From August 1994 to September 1996, he was the chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal from the for, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. He's an honorary member of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York and a foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's an honorary bencher of the Inner Temple London. He's the honorary president of the Human Rights Institute and the International Bar Association. The awards he has received include the International Human Rights Award of the American Bar Association in 1994 and the International Justice Award of John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation in December 2009. We are very honored to have you on board with us, sir, and uh, to learn from you as you deliver your lecture today. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Ronald, and thank you very much indeed, Dr. Gopur, for your for your warm welcome. Uh, I, I'm delighted to have been able to accept the invitation from your law school, and particularly in my capacity as a member of the Judicial Council of the International Association of Law Schools. I speak to you from a quite cold Johannesburg in South Africa. Unfortunately, Johannesburg is sharing with you in Pune the, the, the huge onslaught from the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic. So, so we're very much in the same, in, the, in, in similar positions at the moment. But I suppose we should be very grateful to, to modern technology that we, are, that we are still able, speaking from our homes to people in our homes. And I'm very happy that there's so many students uh, who, who are listening uh, to, to this uh, 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 webinar uh, that, that we are able to, 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 to do this, as I say, across continents and across oceans. Uh, it's an auspicious day for this, uh, for, for us to consider international criminal law, particularly because today is the World Day for International Justice. And I will come back to that in a moment. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to have to do it uh, f f fairly succinctly and, and, and economically because of the amount of material, but I hope you will bear with me. Uh, a little bit of history, first of all. Before the Nuremberg trials in 1945 of the Nazi leaders after the Second World War, the, the four victorious nations put the Nazi leaders on trial. This had never been done before, and they needed a law to do this. There, there was no real international criminal law in those days. The law of wars applied to governments and, and, and didn't include uh, criminality for individuals. But at Nuremberg, they, they were inventive and, uh, and, and the Nazi leaders were charged and found guilty of crimes of aggression, of war crimes, and a new concept, crimes against humanity. Then the next development was really in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, uh, which recognized for the first time what are called the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. 
these for the first time created criminal criminal responsibility by individual soldiers and leaders, military leaders, political leaders, for, for, for uh, uh, serious uh, contraventions of the Geneva Conventions. The success of the Nuremberg Tribunal really began a movement to uh, create a permanent international criminal court. If one looks at the Genocide Convention of 1948, uh, one, one sees there that there was a reference to a court of, to, to an international criminal court created by treaty. But unfortunately, nothing happened for nearly 50 years. In particular, the Cold War intervened and, and, and international, the International Criminal Court was put onto a back burner. But it was the terrible crimes that were committed in the, in, the, in the first half of the 1990s, firstly in the former Yugoslavia, where huge war crimes and genocide were committed, and then in, in, in 1994, the, the genocide in, in Rwanda, in West Africa, where almost a million people uh, were, 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 were murdered uh, for, 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 for really racial and ethnic, and ethnic reasons. And in the face of those uh, 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 war crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Security Council of the United Nations, using its peremptory powers, created two new international instruments. One was the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the second was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. It was my privilege and very difficult job uh, to be the first prosecutors uh, the, the, to be the first prosecutor for both of those tribunals. They were successful in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in bringing the leaders of armies and paramilitary groups responsible for the terrible war crime to trial in The Hague. Uh, some hundreds were, were, were put on trial and many of them are now serving long prison sentences in Europe and in Africa. The successes in turn of those two tribunals led to so-called hybrid or mixed tribunals being, being established in Sierra Leone, in Cambodia, in Kosovo and in Lebanon. Then in the middle of 1998, to, to the surprise of most international lawyers, uh, over 140 nations gathered uh, in, uh, in, in Rome and decided to establish a permanent international criminal court, the ICC. 120 nations voted in favor of what is called the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is really the constitution that governs the international criminal court. And it's, it's made up of an assembly of states parties uh, to which every member state that's ratified the Rome Statute uh, is, is a party. Today, there are 123 members of the Assembly of States parties. It is the governing body of the ICC, of the International Criminal Court, and it elects the, the, the judges and the, the prosecutor. Now, importantly, the, the ICC is founded on the principle of complementarity, and I'll come back to that in the context later of an international anti-corruption court. The, the, the system of complementarity means that the international court is a court of last resort. It has no jurisdiction at all if the country where the criminals uh, live, uh, the, the, the governments of, of, of their countries, if those countries decide themselves to investigate and put on trial uh, alleged uh, uh, war criminals, then the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction. So any, any, any country can keep away the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court by investigating its own suspected and alleged war criminals. Um, there are two ways in which people can come before the court, uh, the International Criminal Court. The one is obviously if crimes are committed within a nation that is a member of the International Criminal Court, the court will have jurisdiction. What's more controversial, but not unusual, is that the court also has jurisdiction 
over war crimes committed by, by, by people who are members, who are national citizens of countries that have joined the International Criminal Court. So to give you, to give you a hypothetical example, uh, if, if an Indian national commits a war crime in my country, South Africa, there, there will be jurisdiction in the International Criminal Court because South Africa is a member. If, if a South African, if, if an Indian citizen commits a war crime in China, the court will have no jurisdiction because neither India nor China is a member of the International Criminal Court. So that, that is the way the, the system of complementarity works. The ICC has been in operation now for 18 years. They've been a difficult 18 years, and the main difficulty, and it was one we faced also in the UN, in the United Nations tribunals, the difficulty is that the International Court does not have any means of enforcing its orders or, or of ensuring that its requests to governments are, are, are respected and carried out. No international court, no international body has its own army, its own police, and therefore it's completely reliant on cooperation from governments if it is to succeed. It can't get people arrested itself. It has to rely on governments to undertake, uh, to undertake arrests. The, the courts had difficult years. There have been complaints about, its, about its, its, the, the cases it's chosen. There have been complaints about its efficiency. And I am at the moment chairing uh, an independent uh, expert review group that was set up uh, at the beginning of this year by the Assembly of States parties. There are nine experts from nine different countries around the world, and our job is, is to try and find ways to strengthen the International Criminal Court and to strengthen the Rome Statute system. And we hard at work, and our final report will be submitted by the end of September of this year. Now, we, we must take into account that, that one of the other problems faced by the International Criminal Court and by many international organizations is that large and powerful countries don't like being judged by international courts, by international committees. And it's for that reason, I would suggest, that the four largest the four most populous countries in the world are not members of the ICC. I refer, I refer of course, to, to China, to your own country, India, to the United States of America and, and to Russia. They don't see it as being in their interest to, be, to, be, to, sub, to, to submit themselves even remotely to the jurisdiction of an international court. And that's a problem. And the, the, only, the only hope is that if the International Criminal Court does act uh, efficiently and does act successfully, some of these larger countries, uh, some of these populous countries may, may change their policy and become, and become members. We are faced too today with, with an added difficulty with regard to international organizations, and that is nationalism, populism, uh, autocracy, and countries wanting to do their own thing. And of course, this is being led at the moment by the present administration in the United States, uh, which puts its own interests above those of the people of all other countries. One understands that, but it's not the way we can have a peaceful and successful world if, if countries don't cooperate with each other. And particularly in the days of the COVID pandemic, uh, where, where we are one world, uh, the, the, the COVID virus doesn't, doesn't recognize and doesn't understand national borders and crosses oceans uh, without any difficulty. The largest number of countries who have joined the ICC uh, come from Africa. And I'm happy to say too that all the members of the European Union have also joined the ICC. As I mentioned, there are 123 nations who have done so. Um, the latest case before the ICC began only two days ago in The Hague. It's against one of the uh, le leaders of an Al-Qaeda group 
um, uh, in, 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 in Mali, in West Africa, that, uh, who is accused of having committed many serious crimes, including rape and sexual slavery, and also being responsible for, for, for religious reasons for destroying the amazing shrines and statues and buildings in the city of Timbuktu in Mali. So that is that is a general general background to the to the International Criminal Court. Uh, it's 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 got judges, 18 judges from from 18 different countries. It's got a staff of about 380 people. It's housed in a in a lovely building uh, just outside the center of the Hague uh, in, uh, in in the Netherlands. It's been obviously suffering too by the uh, by the pandemic. It's, it's, it's having its court cases. I mentioned one started this week. It's being done remotely. The, the accused is, is listening to the, it, he has to listen uh, from, uh, from his prison cell in The Hague and the judges uh, are involved remotely uh, with the trial. This is a problem, obviously, that's facing, facing not only international courts, but also courts in your country and my own country. Now, let me turn to corruption. Uh, as was mentioned, I think, uh, by, by, by Dr. Gopwa, th there really is no, no nation that is free from corruption. However, what many of us are concerned about uh, is what is called grand corruption, also known as tectocracy. This is the abuse of public office for personal gain. And we've seen some autocratic leaders on my continent and your continent and in Europe and, and, and elsewhere, use their position of, of authority, using their positions often as head of state to, 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 to corrupt the financial position of their own countries for their own personal benefit and for the benefit of their own families. Only recently there, 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 was, there, there was the situation in Angola not far from where I'm sitting, uh, where, where, where the uh, president, the former president of Santos uh, stole uh, uh, hundreds of millions of US dollars worth of, 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 of monies and, and goods and, 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 and hid them in various places in Europe. And, and, and his daughter, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Santos, is, is now the major beneficiary of, uh, of that corruption. So there is this grand corruption kleptocracy by leaders. I'm embarrassed, I regret to say that our own former president, Jacob Zuma, uh, also got involved uh, with, with what, what, what is called in South Africa a state capture. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a connection there too, uh, because the th three of the people uh, who, who got involved with him were, were three, three uh, Indian nationals who became South African citizens the Gupta brothers, who are now hiding out in the United Arab Emirates. Um, now, the, the problem, of course, with, with many uh, uh, um, kleptocrats is that they also, because of their position uh, in government, are able to control and infiltrate the police and the prosecution service and sometimes even the courts. And that makes it difficult to get at them. Um, the victims of grand corruption, the victims of kleptocracy, are the poor people of the country's concern. It's from, their, it's from them that the monies are being stolen. Their starvation in many cases is a result of this kleptocracy and corruption. It's been estimated that developing countries in the world lose 10 times more to corruption than they receive in foreign aid, 10 times more than the foreign aid. It is estimated that the amounts plundered a year exceed 1 trillion US dollars. So we're talking about huge, huge amounts of money and, and, and huge damage being done to millions of innocent people. The former High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations, um, my fellow South African and a good friend, Navi Pillay said in, 19, said in 2013, when she was the High Commissioner, I quote, she said, corruption kills. The money stolen through corruption every year 
is enough to feed the world's hungry 80 times over. Corruption denies them their right to food and in some cases their right to life. And one, one, one last quote from the, the New York Times uh, correspondent Nicholas Kristof, who's done a great deal for human rights in many countries. He said grand corruption also has fatal consequences in other ways. In Sierra Leone, one third of the funds allocated to combat Ebola in 2014 could not be accounted for, although some of those funds, he wrote, were found in the bank accounts of health officials administering the program. So you had, you had unbelievably callous people, administrators, who were using the money that were meant to save the lives of people who had contracted Ebola, were, were, were putting the money instead into their own private bank accounts. In 2016, more than 40 countries met in London for an anti-corruption summit. They, they unanimously endorsed the global declaration against corruption that commits each of them to, to the proposition that the corrupt should be, should be pursued and punished. In, in 2003, the United Nations passed a convention called the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC, UNCAC. 187 countries have now pledged under UNCAC uh, to enact laws criminalizing corruption and to enforce them even against their own leaders. But 187 countries came together. Why? Because the, the members of UNCAC, the 187 members, were really doing little to carry out in their own countries what they, obliged, what they were obliged to do by the, by the International Convention. And the participating governments who met in London in, in, in 2018 undertook, they committed themselves to exploring innovative solutions to combat corruption. One of the results has been the United Nations uh, uh, Secretary General and the, and the, 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 the head of, 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 of other United Nations uh, uh, bodies, the, the head of uh, uh, the, the Social and Economic Council, got together and have set up a high level investigation into ways of avoiding corruption. It's known by its acronym FACTI. And it goes further in April, in the middle of April of next year, of 2021, the United Nations General Assembly is holding a special session on corruption. We have a, a, a two day session dealing with ways of stopping corruption. One of the ways some of us, I have a number of colleagues in, 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 in the United States, in South Africa, in Colombia, in Peru, in Canada, who are intent, we are intent on trying to push the idea of setting up a new international anti-corruption court. It will also work on the system of complementarity. So that if somebody from my country commits corruption, the international court would not have jurisdiction, would not have jurisdiction unless the South African courts were not doing anything about it. So it's a court like the International Criminal Court. It's a court of last resort. An international anti-corruption court would have one huge advantage over the International Criminal Court. And that is that people who commit corruption, kleptocrats, what do they do with the money that they steal? They don't put it in a local bank. Obviously not. That's the last thing they're going to do. They send it abroad. They send it to, to, to investment banks in Switzerland, in Singapore, and other so-called safe havens uh, in, in some of the islands, also in, in the United Arab Republic. Uh, people, people with money to launder, stolen funds, invest the money and hide it away in these countries. And the importance of an international anti-corruption court is there's no reason why those countries shouldn't join. The United Arab Republic, the Swiss government, the Singaporean government are not themselves corrupt. 
they, they are not stealing. They, they are the recipients. Their banks and their institutions are the recipients of the ill-gotten gains. And if countries like that joined in an international anti-corruption court, the court would have jurisdiction to go to those countries to freeze the ill-gotten gains, to recover the ill-gotten gains. And that should be an attraction to many large countries across the world where, where, where stolen monies end up. And of course, I don't exclude London and New York and, and, uh, and, other, and other large, large financial capitals uh, around the world. There's only one way to stop crime, and I'm sure you would agree with me. The only way to stop crime is to have efficient policing. If, if would-be criminals fear that they're going to get caught and brought to court and punished, they are less likely to commit their crimes. I'm not naive and I don't believe that the most efficient criminal justice system, the most efficient police force in the world will, will stop all crime. Obviously not. There are always going to be people who think they know better, they think they, 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 they're sufficiently clever to get away with it. But the more efficient, the lower the crime rate. If you look around the world, you'll find that the crime rate is higher in countries where there's an efficient, where there's an inefficient police force and the crime rate will be lower where there is an efficient police force. If, if one can rely on the police uh, to, 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 to investigate crime efficiently, that is the best way of, of reducing the, 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 the crime rate in your country or my country or any other country. Um, the greater incentive for powerful nations to join is, is, is precisely what I've said, that it will be a way an international criminal court would be a means of, 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 laying the, of, of enabling victims in a country to benefit from, from, from the efforts of an international anti-corruption court. In concluding, let me say that if we are going to have a better and more peaceful world, then international criminal court can play a crucial role. It cannot be right, it's not moral and it's not just that people who commit war crimes, war criminals, should get away with it. They shouldn't be given impunity. War criminals should, 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 should be aware, no matter what their position is in a country, they should be aware that there is a court that, that is willing and able and will have the support of, of the global community in investigating their war crimes and bringing them to, uh, to justice. So th 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 that is my brief survey of where we are at present and my plea for an international anti-corruption court. Thank you for your attention and I'll be very happy in the short time we have to answer any questions you, you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Raj uh, is going to be moderating the session, sir, and he will be taking the questions from the students who are putting it on the chat box, and uh, uh, we will take it one by one. Professor Raj, uh, I request you yes, to sir. come in, please. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, the first question is by a person he is asking, since you have talked about the Nuremberg trials, could you give us your opinion on the legality of the capture and for the trial of Mr. Adolf Eichmann by Mossad. Right. Well, I, th I think from, from an international law point of view, the, 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 the capture uh, by, by, by Israeli secret uh, uh, service of, of Eichmann from, from Argentina w was a contravention of law. It was clearly a contravention of the law of Argentina Nobody can come into your country and my country and start arresting people, no matter what crimes they've committed. And the United Nations did, did recognize uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Security Council of the United Nations, recognized the, the illegality in international law of the uh, arrest and, and, and really the kidnapping of, of Adolf Eichmann. Uh, Israel ended up apologizing to Argentina and Argentina ended up accepting the apology. I think, I think there was a realization 
that having regard to the to the level of criminality of Eichmann, that it was a mitigating circumstance. But the answer to the question uh, is, uh, is is that it 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 it, it, it wasn't legal. Um, the the court the 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 Israeli judges were faced with an application by Eichmann, who said, "Look, I've been illegally brought here. Release me. You've got no right to 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 put me on trial." But the the Israeli judges followed precedent in the United Kingdom, in the courts of of, of England, and in the court of the United States to the effect that it's not the job of judges to, to investigate how people come before them. If the person before them is the, is the correct person, then they must put them on trial. I, I must say it, it's of interest that uh, during, during the apartheid regime in South Africa, towards the end of that period, uh, in, 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 19, in 1989, a South African court was faced with that sort of situation. The South African police, the apartheid police, went illegally into our neighbours, Swaziland, now Iswatini, and they kidnapped an accused wanted for, for treason. And he came to trial in Pretoria, and he took what's now known as the Eichmann defence. He said, look, I was kidnapped. I've got no right, uh, you've got no right to put me on trial. And the, the trial judge followed the precedents to which I've referred, and he said the trial will proceed. The man called Ibrahim, he was an Indian South African, was found guilty and sentenced to a life in prison. He went on appeal to our Supreme Court of Appeal, and there five judges investigated the law under Roman Dutch law, which is our common law. And they held that under, under, under Roman Dutch law, a person who's been kidnapped into the jurisdiction may not be put on trial. And our, our Supreme Court of Appeal uh, set aside the trial and ordered Mr. Ibrahim to be returned to Swaziland, where he'd been kidnapped by the police. So I think I think that gives you a very quick overview of the of the of the situation. Right, sir. So the next question is: How does the ICC determine whether it has jurisdiction over a case or not if the crime is committed on the high seas? So could could could, could you repeat that? Is, yes. is it on the Q and A? Yes, I've just published it. It is how does the ICC determine whether it has jurisdiction over a case or not if the crime was committed on the high seas? Oh, right. Well, you know, that is that is a good question because the, the law of piracy is, 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 is unique. Um, centuries ago already, the international community, members of the international community decided that piracy was a unique case because it, 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 where, where crimes are committed on the high sea, there's no court of jurisdiction. There are no courts on the high seas. And, and they decided that for that reason, there should be universal jurisdiction for piracy. Universal jurisdiction means that it doesn't matter where the crime is committed. It means that for, for, for crimes subject to universal jurisdiction, the court of any country in the world has got jurisdiction. So, so if, if, if an act of piracy is, is committed uh, in the Indian Ocean or, or, off, the coast of, uh, off the coast of India, that person can be put on trial in England or South Africa or Ghana or any other country under universal jurisdiction. This, this idea of universal jurisdiction was restricted to piracy, but in more recent years it's been growing and it now applies to other international crimes such as genocide, uh, slavery, uh, and, 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 and certain huge war crimes where, where courts can, can, can exercise jurisdiction. So, for example, the, 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 the courts of France have recently and in the past put on trial people who committed crimes during the genocide in Rwanda. The crimes weren't committed in France and the accused people weren't French and the victims were in French, but the French courts exercised universal jurisdiction. Yes, thank you, sir. So the next question is that how do Scandinavian countries avoid corruption as they score consistently high in the transparency index? What is it that they do different in the Scandinavian countries? Sorry, could you speak a bit more slowly? I, I, I have trouble hearing. Right, sir. Sir, in the Scandinavian countries, 
What do they do differently that they have? So, a very so, high so, so, in, in which countries? In the Scandinavian countries, in Sweden, Scandinavian countries, in Denmark, Sweden, what is it that they do differently that they have very low corruption? So, is, is, is this question on the uh, yes, on sir, the yes, Q and A? Yes, sir, yes, it's on the Q and A. Well, there's a lot of a lot of questions here. Um, so, you, 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 again, if you would like, can, can can you refer to me on the? Can you refer to on the Q and A? Sir, it's in the published list in the third question in the published list. Third question. What number? Sorry, what number? Uh, sir, it's on number three. So I, I I I don't see it. If 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 is it possible for me to deal with the questions that appear on the on the Q and A? All right. So we can take the next question. I, I see that the, 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 there's one question here um, from from Advait. He said you spoke about the difficulty in holding states which aren't members of the ICC accountable. Are there alternatives to the ICT to prevent war criminals from gaining impunity? Well, again, thank you. That, that's a very good question. There really isn't. The only way that, that uh, war criminals can be brought to justice is in the courts of their own countries or in an international criminal court or in a country using universal jurisdiction. Now, universal jurisdiction is very seldom used, as I've said. And it only applies at the level of genocide and, and, and not to less, uh, but ev even though serious uh, uh, war crimes. So there really isn't any, any, any serious alternative to the International Criminal Court. And of course, one important aspect too of the International Criminal Court is that its existence does encourage national governments to bring people to justice. If I can give you one example, the Security Council, more than 10 years ago, requested the International Criminal Court to investigate war crimes committed in Sudan, and, and particularly in the region of Darfur. And the, the, the International Criminal Court, acting on the, at the request and under the powers of the Security Council, investigated it, and they took the, 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 the bold decision to issue an arrest warrant against the president of Sudan, uh, President al-Bashir. And uh, the, the, the Sudanese government ignored the International Criminal Court and to, and, and, and to their shame, uh, some even members of the International Criminal Court failed to arrest uh, President al-Bashir when he visited their countries. Again, I'm embarrassed that South Africa was one of those countries that refused to, to arrest President al-Bashir. But it's amazing how the wheel turns because since then, uh, there was a coup uh, in, in Sudan. President al-Bashir was, 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 uh, was put out of power. He's now in prison. And, and, and it, may, it may well be that the Sudanese government could still send President al-Bashir to trial in The Hague. One of his main collaborators, uh, in fact, is now in The Hague, recently uh, was, was, was uh, arrived in The Hague and is being put on trial for very serious crimes against the people in Darfur. He was the leader of the paramilitary group called the Janjaweed, who went on horseback and, and burnt villages and killed people uh, in, uh, in the crimes that were committed uh, in Darfur, including genocide with which President Al-Bashir has been charged. So the next can, question can I, is, yeah. What do I you, go? yes, so the next Sorry. question. Yeah, what the, 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 the entire yeah. system of policing, does it mean giving more powers to them so that there is lesser interference by the political executive? Or what is your idea basically of a better system of policing? So again, I think I'm, I'm having trouble with the sound here. Can you repeat that? Right, sir. So what the question is, what do you intend by a better system of policing? Do you mean giving 
more powers to them so that there is lesser interference by political executive so I, I'm, I'm i'm still having problem is this not a written is this not a written question so it's written it is written I'm I'm sorry to be I'm sorry to be difficult, but 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 the sound the sound is 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 not too good at, at my end. Um, can I take another question from from the list? Yes, sir. It is in the list. It is it is in the list. Yes. Right, right sir. Right. It is in the list. Well, an, another question I see <coughs> is from somebody anonymous. What, what, according to you, can be another means through which the criminal justice system? can be made more efficient and rigid apart from maintaining a strong police force. Well, you, you know, that, that, that really doesn't apply to, to international uh, criminal law. It's a question of national law. But the criminal justice system depends not only on a strong police, but on, 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 on courts that, that are not corrupt. And, and fortunately, both, both your country and my country uh, have been blessed uh, with having good judges and, uh, and good courts. Um, there, there's another question my eye falls on here. Um, could you comment on the effectiveness of international criminal court decisions on countries who decide to bypass them? For example, the United States invading the Middle Eastern countries and continuing operations for decades on. Well, well, this is this is a huge matter of debate in the United States. You know, the United States in some ways is, is a strange country in many ways, perhaps. But the United States has a, a dual uh, 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 approach to, to, the, to international criminal justice. Without the United States, there would not be an international criminal court. Without the United States, there would not have been uh, the, the United Nations courts for Yugoslavia uh, and, 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 and Rwanda. It was the United States that pushed the United Nations to set up those courts, and the United States gave a lot of resources, human resources and financial resources, to the Yugoslavia and Rwanda courts. <coughs> it was the United States that really pushed for the Rome Treaty, for, 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 for the meeting in Rome that led to the Rome Statute. But, but once it was passed, the United States' attitude and it was mainly because of their military. The United States attitude has been, was, it's no longer, but the United States attitude was, look, the rest of the world, international criminal justice, it's a very good idea. We support it. We'll even pay for it. But don't include us. Look after the rest of the world. We'll look after ourselves. <clears throat> that was the attitude. Of course, now it's changed under the Trump administration. There's no longer any ambiguity. The United States is simply saying the International Criminal Court is bad news, it's biased, and, 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 we, and, and we apply sanctions, and we apply sanctions to it. Um, uh, there, there's another question, also anonymous. Do, do crimes of aggression come under the jurisdiction of the ICC? The answer is yes. In, in, in Rome in 1998, the, the nations couldn't agree whether aggression should be included. So they decided to, 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 to postpone a decision for 10 years. And in, 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 19, in, in, 19, uh, in 2009, in Kampala, uh, in, in Uganda, the Assembly of States parties, strangely and to the surprise of many, agreed without dissent that they should add the crime of aggression uh, to, to, to the list of crimes that fall within the, the International Criminal Court. Um, it, 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 it's a difficult crime to prove. The, the, the court would have to liaise with the Security Council, which is really responsible for aggression. But the answer, as I say, is, is a positive one. There is jurisdiction uh, for, for, uh, for, 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 for corruption. Then I see the, the, there's a, a question from Deepanish Jain as to, the, to this effect. I have a question regarding the instrumentalization by states. As many states, while acting legally, use the ICC for political motives and it sometimes works against the international criminal justice. 
what's my view about that? Well, uh, you, you're quite correct. Some countries do use the International Criminal Court for political reasons. And for example, a, a, a countries like, like, like Uganda uh, use the court, the, the, the government of, of, of President Museveni in Uganda, the, the, court, the, 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 the government of Uganda referred its own situation to the International Criminal Court. Now, it wouldn't do that if it wasn't thought to be in its own political interests. And I, I'm a little critical of the of the International Criminal Court having simply accepted that. I understand it, it was at a stage where it didn't have any cases at all. It was a brand new court. And here government says, please, Mr. Prosecutor, investigate crimes committed in my country in Uganda. Well, the, the, the prosecutors said, yes, of course, we'll do that. But it, it, it was a political use of the court. And, and, and one of the justifiable criticisms, in my view, uh, is that the court uh, investigated crimes by the Lord's Resistance Army, a, a terrorist group that was using child soldiers, but it didn't investigate very serious war crimes that were led to have been committed by the National Defence Army uh, of Uganda. So you've got that politics, and of course, uh, uh, politics is is an inevitable presence in international justice. Uh, without politics, you don't have international courts. Without politics, they can't succeed. And the job of the prosecutor, of the office of the prosecutor, and the job of the judges is to is to find the path through that political jungle and ensure that it's not influenced by politics. That the question of who is who is investigated. Who is prosecuted? The question of who is guilty, who is innocent, should have nothing at all to do with politics. And, and, and that was a job, I think, that has been done pretty well by international criminal courts, uh, including the International Criminal Court. I think that brings us to the end of our, of our period. Is that correct, Professor? So we can just take one more question. Sure. Um, the question here from, from Aditya is, why do we need another court where, where there is an international court of justice? Well, thank you very much for that important, very important question. The International Court of Justice is the highest court of the United Nations. It also sits in Rome. But the International Court of Justice only can, can decide cases between governments. It's not a criminal court. It can't decide any case against an individual. Not only that, it can only decide disputes between governments if those governments agree. There has to be a consent by a government to submit to the jurisdiction of the, of the, interna of, of the International Court of Justice. So it has no jurisdiction over war crimes. It has no jurisdiction uh, over, over corruption or over any other international, uh, international crimes. So it's an important court for deciding some disputes between governments, but it in no way answers the problem of war crimes and corruption. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Bindu Ronald. Symbiosis uh, Law School Pune is indeed honored to host this distinguished IALS speaker program which we had an opportunity uh, to have over here and for providing this opportunity to our students and faculty to interact with some of the best legal minds. And to begin with this series, we today had Justice Richard Goldstone, who is the former Justice South African Constitutional Court, who spoke with us on the topic of the current state of international criminal law and the necessity for an international anti-corruption court. As we come to the close of this lecture, it's also my privilege to thank all those who made this possible. Thank you very much, Justice Goldstone, for this erudite talk on the topic of the current state of international criminal law and the necessity for an international anti-corruption court. It definitely ignited the minds of the students to put forth their questions and thank you so much for answering their queries so patiently.
Right. We do thank, hope thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And we do hope that you will continue this connect with Symbiosis Law School Pune. And oh, we will true. have the opportunity. Yes, and we will have the opportunity of hearing from you more. I'll also take Perfect. this opportunity to thank. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Gurpur, who is the director of Symbiosis Law School Pune for uh, bringing the best minds to the law school. Uh, Dr. Gurpur, thank you very much for the leadership that you bring to the law school, which takes the law school to the path of excellence. I'll also place on record over here the support that we've been receiving from the IT team and also thank Professor Sujata Arya for coordinating this event. Thank you, Professor Lassia, for introducing Dr. Gurpur and our distinguished invitee Justice uh, Richard Glowstone uh, in the beginning of this event. Last but most important, all our viewers, thank you very much. Thank you for encouraging us by your presence and by your questions. Thank you. I thank each one of you for your presence here and thank you very much, Justice Goldstone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, sir. Bye, sir.